you can you can hear me all right yeah um i'm i'm enid um i am the moderator of this panel um i'm just checking the time here because we've got a lot to to get through um Priya, thank you so much for your excellent presentation uh lots of food for fraud thought and um i just we, we we've had the introduction earlier but i'm um, just very quickly um i just want to ask oscar to do a quick presentation um to get us up to speed perhaps with what the asia art archive has been doing in the area of women in the arts and then we'll get to the panel discussion okay can you hear me okay all right uh good morning everyone thank you Enid, and thank you yes for a generous introduction um, and thank you, um, Hong Kong AGA, for, and Fabio and Jessica and the whole team for the invitation and Asia Society for hosting us. Um, so today what I would like to do is to, to, to give a couple of examples about how Asia Arts Archive has been trying to contribute to the discussions around gender imbalance in the arts. Um, but maybe I say, maybe I don't say a couple of words about the title. Please hold on to the title and which I will speak uh, about in the end, and the title is How Not to Start from Zero. Um, so I'll start by giving a very short overview about what Asia Arts Archive does for those of you who are less familiar with the organization. Um, Asia Arts Archive started as a library in 2000, and this is how our library looks like today. Um, over the last decade or so, uh, the organization has grown in terms of the archival collection. So this is a photograph of our special collections room where we have um, the, the physical collections, by physical archives that are donated to our organization. But uh, primarily, our users access AAA through our website. So this is the, the landing page for our digital collections, which we call the, the research collections. And maybe one word about them. These uh, collections, they are personal archives of artists, art educators, and art historians. And we don't buy these archives. What we do is that the researchers, they identify these archives, they go to these where archive, they go to the places where these archives are, they digitize them, so in the end we open them up on our website. So it's not necessarily about collecting them in one place, but it's really about thinking about how to distribute them, how to circulate them. And when it comes to our topic of the day, um, I should say that earlier this year, in collaboration with the, the University of Hong Kong, we invited the Guerrilla, Guerrilla Girls to Hong Kong. Um, Dr. Kun, our partner in crime from HKU, is in the audience, so hello, Dr. Kun. Um, so if you look at these statistics, I mean, you might be familiar with the, the practice of the guerrilla girls. I mean, since the, the mid-1980s, they've been using numbers and they've been using statistics to provoke discussion around the representation of women artists and also representation of, representation of race in the individual arts. And maybe we can go back to, to the structural problems that are hinted by these numbers in our discussion, but I just want to say that Asia Arts Archive is not necessarily immune to, this, um, to these problems, as you can see from the, the last um, percentage. So right now I can say that the percentage just changed just a slightly, um, you know, it's slightly better. Um, so only eight out of 36 research collections that we have they come from um, women donors. So I think for me, more importantly, is the, the team has acknowledged this as an issue a couple of years ago. So right now we've been trying to, to think about the tools and the strategies to, to think about this imbalance within our co own collections in the first place. And then we can discuss the, the general problems in the art scene. Um, I'll just give two examples from these research collections that are recent. So they are from 2008. Uh, the Salima Hashmi archive is a great example that I wanted to talk about because as you might be familiar with her practice, she's a very established artist, writer and art educator from Pakistan. And since the early 1980s, she's been writing extensively about the representation of women artists. Um, so this is just one example. It's a manifesto. Uh, this is an example from the archive. It's a manifesto written and signed by 16 different women artists from Pakistan. Uh, it was, um, it's dated 1983, and because of the, the political conditions of that day, it was not published. And you can, you can find it on the, the website. Uh, the second example that I wanted to share with you, it's Betsy Damon Archive, Keepers of the Waters. Um, Betsy Damon, she's an artist and she's an environmental activist who traveled to China in the, 19, in the 1990s, early 1990s. And she initiated a series of public installation and performances 
in two cities, in Chengdu in 1995 and in Lhasa in 1996. So when you think about this particular archive, it's not necessarily about an archive about women artists, but it's a really interesting one for this reason. Uh, when you think about the iconic images of performance art coming from China from the 1990s, you will probably immediately think about these male artists coming from big cities like um, Beijing or Shanghai. They would work individually. They would photograph their own bodies. Um, so it's a very particular practice that we are talking about. But in this example, you will see a lot of examples of um, community-based performances, participatory performances. They would discuss ideas collectively. And many of the artists are women artists, including Yin Shui Zhen, Washing River. It's a quite well-known performance artwork. And Zhang Xing, sewing that she did, that she performed in Lhasa in 1996. And this is a photograph of a recent public talk from two weeks ago that we organized. So on the, the left, you'll see Jane de Beauvois, a researcher and also co-chair of our organization, and Cici Wu on the, the far right of the photograph, both researchers who worked on this archive. And we invited artists uh, Jan Xing and Dai Guan Yu to speak about the, the Keepers of the Waters event. So at this point, I want to say that public programs are crucial to what we do at Asia Arts Archive, because this is how we activate these research collections. But more importantly, this is how we try to build communities or how we try to, to build kind of a critical mass to, to ask the, the questions that we are also discussing with the panel today and hopefully with you today. Uh, and if I want to give two more examples, if I have time, I want to say that uh, Yoshiko Shimada, um, who's an artist and researcher based in Japan, when we hosted her for a residency um, at Asia Art Archive in May, she said something very important. She's been participating in many feminist informed exhibitions and uh, collectives and networks since the early 1990s. And she said that they haven't necessarily created a very in-depth intellectual conversation about gender, but they were much needed support structures. So they were tools for solidarity, which was needed and which is needed today as well. And the second example that I want to talk about is the, the Wikipedia editathons that we co-organize and we still continue to organize them in collaboration with Amplus. Um, and maybe one thing that I should emphasize is that we were also inspired by the Guerrilla Girls. So we were also interested in looking at numbers. But in our case, we wanted to, to look at numbers on Wikipedia, the free accessible um, online encyc encyclopedia that anyone in the world, anyone in this room can edit. So um, when you look at the numbers on Wikipedia, you see that only 20% of the women artists, they are represented on Wikipedia. And only 11% of Wikipedia editors, they identify as women. So this gender imbalance is not necessarily shocking, to say the least. So what we did was to, to get together uh, with our participants. We first learned how to edit Wikipedia and we improved the existing articles and we also created new ones for women artists in Asia. Um, but please don't get me wrong, it wasn't a perfect exercise because we also learned about the limitations of this particular exercise. Um, because when you, if you want to create a new page on Wikipedia about a woman artist that you, know, you really want to contribute with, this person has to be notable in quotation marks according to the Wikipedia standards. And that means that in their words, they have to have gained sufficiently significant attention by the world at large and um, over a period of time. And this is precisely one of the, the bigger problems that we have in the, in the arts. I mean, as Freya mentioned, when you think about the museum show, when you think about the scholarship, we just don't have enough of these things, enough resources, enough primary materials um, so that we can work on this issue. So I think we have to, to acknowledge that. And, but we kept editing because I think it's important that we take matters into our hands as well, rather than um, pointing fingers. So this is the, the last slide that I have. Um, it's the, the cover of an all women exhibition from 1995. It comes from our library collection. I would like to, to read the title for you because it's a little bit uh, small. The title of the exhibition was Discovered by Chance, an art exhibition by women recommended by their husbands of the Central Fine Arts Academy. So um, I can hear the, the giggles. Uh, I think some of us might find this outrageous, but I would like to, to think about it as a symptom for all the, the words or all the discourses that we've been using and how fast and how radically it has changed 
um, I just want to remind you that this was only 23 years ago. Um, and I think this is the point when I will go back to, to the title, How Not to Start from Zero, which is a note to an essay by a Hong Kong-based artist, Phoebe Mann, that she wrote in 2004. And the title of her article, of her essay, was um, Discussions Always Start from Zero. So I guess um, maybe just one word about what she writes about is she, you know, similar to Yoshiko Shimada, she also says that there's a rising number of exhibitions with women artists, but they don't necessarily contribute to the intellectual conversations around gender. So I guess our biggest struggle or biggest challenge for today and also for the, the larger arts community is how not to start from zero. And I'll stop here. Thank you. No, I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, the, the Guerrilla Girls, um, you know, their famous work, you know, the, the, the women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum. That was in the 80s. And, you know, it, the various writers, curators have pointed out that the, 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 the debate, the conversation about women representation, you know, it's a repetitive, you know, cycles of amnesia. Um, and so it's important that we perhaps try and address today the systemic issues and also how to get the momentum going. By momentum, I'm I mean what we're seeing this very minute. Um, it seems because of the Me Too movement, perhaps, and also the counting that we've all been doing has raised awareness. And in the past, well, in 2018, I've certainly seen more solo shows in Hong Kong, at least, um, dedicated to female artists. We've got Shirley Jie, the first um, woman to get a solo ex exhibition at the Hong Kong Pavilion in Venice next year. So it seems perhaps on the surface that things are getting a bit better. But um, let's bring the conversation to Doris and Ellen's own personal experience as artists in Hong Kong. And um, <laughs> here, you, yeah, 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 OK. And, um, um, I'm, I'm especially interested in hearing whether you think that, because Doris, I mean, your work, uh, especially your show in 2016 at, at Spring Workshop, was very much to do with having to face your personal fears and um, perhaps, you know, lack of com uh, uh, confidence, um, partly because you're a female artist. And um, I want to ask you whether you feel that the low representation, the low visibility of female artists in Hong Kong and elsewhere has to do with women not you know, leaning in, not pushing themselves out there enough. What's your experience? Um, uh, actually, the spring uh, solo so uh, mentioned was created by uh, Christina also. Um, and we talk about um, just at bad end. We talk about uh, I, we hope that people will not just interpret the show as a mother going back to his artistic career and then uh, with her baby and her art practice every day. And because it's at some level demeaning some of the works in the show, and this um, conversation continues with. Um, because Christina will create the show next year at the Venice Biennial. So we talk about it's also demeaning that people are talking about, oh, finally we got a woman artist represent Hong Kong. And then just uh, at every little single moment of these uh, events, and you will feel like it's our struggle that we really hope people look at the art and not look at the word female. I mean, you, you mentioned that um, earlier in our discussion that you think that your experience at art school is, was, was quite different from the current generation. Can, mm -hmm. can you explain? Um, just um, when I was uh, in the art school, we, we feel like uh, being a female artist means that you are an like obsessive pattern maker or like uh, a sewing machine lover or um, um, subtle storyteller of your drastic relationship or sexual experience. But nowadays, because I'm now teaching at the same school, and then the girls now in the school and they have 
they have none of these struggles. And they really embrace, um, if they want to be just a typical sweet girl, they, they, they embrace that. If they want to be a traditional feminist, they embrace that. If they want to be a bad feminist, they embrace that. So it's a really huge difference that they don't struggle with that kind of, um, another kind of like um, collective consciousness that are ah, what a female artist will do and they don't have that kind of struggle anymore. Now, I mean, okay, so, I mean Ellen, you, know, you, you, you mentioned to me earlier that if you feel there are two kinds of women artists, artists who happen to be, as in your case, you know, bi biologically female um, and then artists who are conscious of the fact that they're, they're women artists and their work shows their critique and negotiation of their identity, be they cis female or transgendered female um, in a man's world. Um, but I just want to you know, push you a little bit further um, to talk about, well, your, your experience. What you've just said seems to suggest that you, know, you are an artist who happens to be um, female and a mother. Um, but I mean, looking at your work though, there's, there's a lot of autobiographical elements which would suggest that you do think about how, for, for example, your experience is different from, say, your husband's. Is, is that fair? Uh, sometimes I think that if, if he really take, take, take up the mother's role, maybe he will make this kind of work too. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really, really choose to be a, a mother of female artists. And I didn't really particularly choose it, but it was just coming from my experience and I experienced that mother's struggle. And, and I, I do not think, um, um, it's just uh, about an identity and it's about just a particular human at this moment she experienced this kind of fear and and struggles okay so ellen how about you sorry you you were you went to art school when in the 90s or 2000 oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay ellen <laughs> Well, you didn't go to art school, you're self-taught, yes. um, but tell us, tell us about your experience um, I, when you were first starting. I just negate myself again. <laughs> I, I think there should not be two types of women artists, there's only one type. Um, always, I, I think um, women, the definition of women has so many um, phase, have, uh, like mother, uh, a wife, um, a daughter, and uh, sometimes uh, it, it, this is a, a more a uh, domestic and family and uh, social structure. This is all the identity in the in the um, in the society. Um, but also, I think uh, uh, what I am thinking is also um, women in the sense that is a. Uh, the other sex, or the second sex, or the third sex, um, which I think a lot of um, uh, cultural theorists or uh, uh, gender study uh, professor academics have a lot of different uh, definition to this. And I think woman is a, a very diversified label, which means almost every human being, because you come from your own mother, and then you carry some of your mother's DNA with you. So actually everyone has her mother nature, has her mother uh, side to it. But it's just how you would like to discover the woman side or the mother side of yourself. And and so I, I just negate my division of uh, how you, I mean, uh, division of there's two types of uh, women artists, which I think there should be only just one type, which is human being. 
And if we have, if we are so inclusive in including all human uh, as women artists, my my goal or my um, purpose of doing that is to um, inject the the humanities into every um, every artist and every audience and uh, even like when you are doing a, a cultural project or an archive, if you think of it as an individual human being and you respect uh, different or, uh, sexual orientations, different um, um, biological being and uh, it will be the whole art world and the whole world would be very different. It's, I mean, what you both just said, um, have, you know, really hammered home the fact that perhaps, you know, the, the statistics that you were showing earlier, it's shocking, but it is not the job of artists to change them. It is um, partly your jobs <laughs> as curators <laughs> and um, program designers um, to, 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 um, to address more directly, perhaps. Um, um, perhaps we can um, start with you, Freya. Um, the, and, and actually, you know, it's, a, it's really a question for both of you because in Hong, in Asia, compared to um, the West, um, there are fewer large public institutions where people go and see art, uh, especially con well, contemporary art, and um, and I wonder if that fact um, has, would, would partly explain the lack of diversity and visibility of um, female artists in Asia. What do you think? That, you know, it's a lot of the, so for example, take Hong, I mean, Hong Kong is a bit extreme, but it is a place where most of the art venues um, are commercial venues. Um, and I'm including, for example, Plampo Art Basel and the other big art fairs. Well, I don't have the statistics of what this representation in the region is. But before uh, starting preparing this talk, I, I tried to look at uh, asking around people in Taiwan and in Singapore. It looks like none of these two cities has Anybody look into the statistics, what exactly this, uh, the, the imbalance of the genders is? I think in, in you wrote an, an article a couple or two years ago at SEMP. You list out, it is a pretty amazing job that you list out the whole year, the galleries. And oh, that, yeah, I did that so, earlier this year, but that yeah. again was only Hong Kong. Yes, mm. but I think it is important. I mean, I was also quite surprised that uh, even with this whole Me Too movement, but there's a lack of this uh, studies and uh, statistics to really to show what the problem is. But I think that's that's important. Uh, but I think it's, it's it's I think what my talk was trying to say is that there's it's not just one dimension of the problem that lack of institutions or lack of uh, female lead voices in the institution. It's the the, the parameter is the whole structure's problem. And I was like joking with friends that maybe after this talk, people would assume that I can only work with female artists. But I mean, this is it's back to what Alan was saying. It's it, it says about human beings that we curators work with artists. We really don't see the genders in the very front. It's not like I wake up today and so, say, okay, I, Today I'm going to work with a female artist. You don't you don't do that because I don't think any female artists want to be considered that way. They want to be honored to the merits of their works, not because all these labels surrounded them. It's the same as I don't want to just be considered as a female curator. What does that even mean? I mean, so I don't know because this uh, my traits and my my advantage of. The, my ability as a curator comes from the formation of who I am, this empathy, how I grow up, this everything. But again, this is a very naive way of thinking if we can think that the whole world will see things so equally. So we still have to take political decisions. You know, we have to take into consideration in a group show, you need to have the balance of 
more female voices to be heard because this is a long process that we have to go through. I don't really know what the reason why is that historically, but looking right now and in the future, things that yes, we need to make changes and the changes maybe it's not exactly what we ideally, ideally think what the R word is or how we sign up for this job. But once we have as a female curator or a female art practitioner, we just have to keep on doing what we are doing because may, if we are the only one can make changes, then we just have to do it. Yeah, any thoughts on? Yeah, um, I think I'll zoom out a little bit and think about the collecting institutions, as you mentioned, because yes, the, the number of collecting institutions and museums in Asia, it is rising. And for that particular reason, I think it's a really timely topic for us to, to discuss, this, especially in Hong Kong, because the the Hong Kong Museum of Art is going to reopen very soon. M plus is on the way. So we'll see more and more permanent collection displays in our city in the first place. Um, but I guess at this point, it's not really about what we expect from these institutions to do or these museums to do, but it's really about us as practitioners, as people working on the field to be much more articulate about our demands. Because you know, at the end of the day, we are the stakeholders of these institutions. and. If, it's, if we are speaking about the artistic commons, we have a say in, um, in wanting to, to see, you know, in what type of artworks and what type of um, discussions that we wanted to see in these institutions. So I think it's a really timely discussion and we have so much work to do. Um, but, but do you think that there's a different sort of pattern when it comes to female representation in public sphere versus the commercial sphere? Um, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Sorry. Priya, any thoughts on that? I mean, I'm asking because a lot of people would say to me, hey, look around Hong Kong, um, look at Doris, look at Ellen. Um, the, in Hong Kong, the uh, women artists do seem to get a lot of opportunity and there are lots of them who are visible. They may not get big solo shows all the time. Um, that's the general impression. But we look at the numbers. I mean, I was quite horrified when I did the count on Hong Kong galleries and found that in the last 10 years, only, well, about 20% of solo exhibitions here were for women. And that made me think that perhaps, you know, because that statistic includes international artists and the big international galleries um, that are operating in Hong Kong. And for the big international galleries that do not represent Hong Kong artists, that statistic, that bias is even worse. And so I think maybe it's because in general, Hong Kong artists are not up there at the top of the market. They do not, we're not talking about big money. So that's why the bias is less for Hong Kong artists. And um, um, <laughs> do, 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 you, do you think that's, that's the case? And because the two of you clearly don't, don't feel that, you know, being female puts you in a disadvantaged position, right? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of invisible um, struggle uh, to be a woman artist in Hong Kong. Um, I also hear uh, people, uh, I would say, um, not accepting uh, lesbian artists or gay artists. And I also see um, this uh, um, a community of um, um, our art professional who are, um, I mean, your story like in Beijing, that um, they would treat women as a subordinate and also would ask them to serve the male artist or the male curator or the museum director uh, when you are sitting on the table having dinner with them. So that is, I mean, I can see that, I can, I hear that and I also 
see saw that um, over the last 30 years. Um, does it change a bit? Yes, it does change a little bit, especially the in the young generation, there are um, more younger women artists coming up, historian, archivists, histo I mean, curators, and there are people who are who already being experienced the oppression from the from the male dominant power society. So I think they will be uh, subconsciously, either subconsciously or consciously aware of this um, mistreatment to a person. I would not say it's inequality, but I mean, I, it's really a, a mistreatment to, uh, to another person, uh, in regard of the sex or sexual orientation of that person. And I think um, that is a really deep down um, way, or uh, I don't know, it's in, in, our, in our long tradition, uh, in Chinese tradition, maybe um, woman is very submissive and, 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 and um, subordinate all the time. So it's like it's, it's already in their mind, in their brain, that they, they would treat people like that. But I mean, um, now, now he's changing a little bit. Um, maybe just Beijing. Yeah. I think the Hong Kong, the Hong Kong men are very gentle. <laughs> and um, but I always do not want to like sound like uh, being a female artist, like making an, an encouraging story, like an underdog working hard to fit in the system. I don't want to sound like that. But all these uh, little tiny stories, uh, which. Um, which uh, I experienced, maybe I will take it as um, I will take some a, a little maybe very black humor into it and see like I'm not going to fill your cup. Even my father does not ask me to fill your cup, and and you just use some humor to look at this, and then I will not take this as really a gender issue. Maybe just their their social norm or their their just normal practice like that and and I just don't feel to like like over interpret some of the situations and but um, there's always uh, little things um, a woman or like uh, a female art workers can do because sometimes uh, you are always like um, maybe having some conversation, normal conversation, and then I remember once um, there's a researcher from Singapore, and he talks about uh, a, a female artist, and he just not really consciously mentioned, oh, she's just alcoholic, and then I would feel, oh, she drinks less than you, <laughs> and then <laughs> and you feel like. Um, there's still some, some, um, yeah, maybe you, you, that's, that's, that's really interesting because that, that maybe we can, um, talk about, um, you know, China, Asia versus the West and how this should, um, um, this, um, fight, um, uh, attempt to raise visibility um, should take the cultural differences into context. Um, so you know, what you both just said, which, and also what you said earlier, um, it gives me the sense that perhaps that guerrilla girl kind of in your face, um, bold messages approach may not always be appropriate in China slash Asia, um, do, 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 is that something that um, that you feel also, or do you think? Can that, you elaborate yeah. on that? You know how could because, yeah, uh, oh, because okay. yeah. you know, 
Doris here, for example, you know, she and and like like a lot of female artists, they you no, know, they don't want to make it into an issue mm -hmm. when you talk about their art. Um, they don't want to be um, involved in a you know big banner, you know, feminist female artist visibility um, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of um, uh, um, uh, um, 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 battle. Um, but you know. AAA and, and Hong Kong U, you know, you brought over Guerrilla Girls and some people will fi find that to be a very American kind of approach mm -hmm. to trying to create change. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if that will, that, that's what we need here or whether it will work. I think it's needed for people who are committed to make a change in their own practice. I mean, personally, it was very useful for me. Um, as working as a curator working with an institution where the there's a very strong um, gender imbalance in the in our for, you know in our collections in the first place so for me it was a statement to say that there is something wrong with our collections in the first place and we are committed to to respond to that I don't think that I agree with you that it might not be um, the best strategy but I guess for people who are willing to to address this in their own practices and in their own institutions it's just a very good statement that would be a conversation starter mm -hmm. um because we cannot stop at that point obviously as you are saying you know we really have to to improve these things we have to to come up with strategies we have to keep the conversation going because at the end of the day i think the the real struggle is to create the conditions of debate about this issue so it's not only one of statements, but it's a really long term process that we really have to, to take into consideration. Um, yeah, do you want to add anything? No, I was just thinking your question back then. I think uh, public institutions or galleries, there are one chapters in the art world. So of course, it, it took a big proportion of the chapters, so, but we cannot just uh, fall into trap that this is the only problem that we have or all female artists need to be included in the because they need to have like market value in order to rep represent in the gallery they there are so many uh, elements we need to take into consideration as story says not every female artist wants to be labeled that way so and it is not just a woman thing it's also men's thing it's everybody working the art we need to have this consciousness and it's just like spreading Deeds. It's in the school. You need to encourage more female artists or people to take art and then believe their voices. And you need to have more female curators in the institution to speak for their own voices. You need to have more female leaders in the institution, more female galleries. But it also, this also needs to change the other opposite sexes or men who they are also working in the art to. You know, because this is, it's about solidarity, you know, if this is... A, no, I said because, you know, we have a lot of students in art school who are female, 80 is what, 80 something percent? Oh, yeah, hmm. We have 60 percent of the gallery association's founding um, members who are female. So we've got all those already. So why, why is visibility still so low? But in terms of visibility, so it's I just from the gallery's point of view or public institution. For public institution, maybe there's a different ways to take into consideration from their collections. We have a lot of practicing artists, but what's looking into the collection, how many female artists were being collected and if they're the only allowed to do their collection show. So this is also, I think it is just many, many ways but i think we are opening these questions now we are presenting the statistics we know what the problem is and then the next step is that how are we going to improve it but it's not like a one night thing this is slowly to change this consciousness may i add something to that um i think visibility is also a tricking variable a tricky variable as you are saying because an example from our public programs um, that we organized with the high school students in Hong Kong in March. So we were saying that this is a discussion that we really want to, to speak more about, um, you know, starting with this year. And some of these teachers, they had this very good comment and they said, when you look at the workforce in Hong Kong, when you look at the, the equal pay, Hong Kong is in a better place compared to, to many places in Asia and they were saying that why is this a relevant question when it comes to art history why should we bother and why should we come to your events you know if you want to, to discuss things and at that point we were saying that 
let's look at the, the existing efforts, like the, the Women's Foundation in Hong Kong, for instance. They've been saying that, yes, there is equal pay, maybe, compared to other places. And um, there is... Um, there is not a huge gender imbalance when it comes to, to the workforce. And, you know, the women are quite visible in the workforce in Hong Kong. But it doesn't mean that the decision maker level is not the, the same situation. So, for instance, as a foundation, they've been working on the, the boards of the companies, going back to, to the commercial side of things, not necessarily about the art world, but also, you know, bigger businesses and corporations. So I think, having said that, I really want to think that if, if we think that we also you know, as the, the arts community in Hong Kong, we are in a better place when it comes to the visibility of women. We have to take the lead in the conversation about, you know, how to, again, keep the, the conditions of debate improve. I, I think we have a responsibility just I because of that. I think that's such too. an important point, actually. Um, okay, I want to do a quick uh, poll here among the, the four of you. In your work, do you find that there's a glass ceiling for women in art organizations, so be it commercial galleries, um, non-profit spaces, museums, etc. No, the people, the top, top decision makers um, who decide what art, which artists to present, to promote, is, is there a gender gap there? From my institution, no. <laughs> I mean, not your, not parasites specifically, but you know, in 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 all your, <laughs> all the organisations where you've worked, and also the ones you deal with on a regular basis. Do you do? Because I hear sometimes that perhaps in the on the commercial side that the top you know director levels of big galleries tend to have far fewer women than men. Um, again, as we know. Um, the art industry in Hong Kong is filled with women, but mostly in the you know, junior level. Um, so, well, yeah. definitely. I mean, I can give you an example of the type of vinyl that uh, this current one, 2018, it was curated by Uma Lee and what I was going to, I forgot his name, sorry. So, this is for since 2004 that type of vinyl has no female curator, uh, there's all men. And this has, it's a system, it's either co-curators or solo curators. And Wuma Li is the one in 2018, and the previous one was in 2004, two female curators. So there was a huge gap for that. But ironically, the decision makers in the vinyl office are mainly women. So why is that even we have a woman uh, chief curator in the office or director, this decision was still has very ambiguous uh, explanation why women didn't speak for the women. So this is, you know, it's not like you put a woman in a director's position and problem will solved. It's the same as we don't have like five women in the panel and the problem was solved. So this is a whole structure issues. It's not just looking the superficial way that's gender soft gender problems. <laughs> oh yeah, I I I remember. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I I I I follow the um, technical uh, business also while I'm following the art business world. Uh, there is also a big cry from um, in in the uh, Silicon Valley about uh, um, why uh, most of the big company in Silicon Valley are dominant by male and not female, not female. And yeah, somebody who wrote a, a <laughs> book about it is at the other Ellen Powell, spelled with an O, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's that's yeah, um, that's from Twitter, and um, so I, um, I think the uh, for a woman to empower herself and to um, build her own system, I, I think in the technical world, 
um, they would start their own business like an entrepreneur, like a startup company. And so I also have this um, experience. I start a uh, video touch and and later microwave. And when I start video touch um, at the very early stage, most of my uh, the people who are working with me are very conscious about the the woman uh, balancing and you know the um, the gender that gender is, issue. And then, um, so I, I think I have to start from my own company and my own organization, which I think applies to any other business sector in, in, in the society also, that if you feel that you want to have a, uh, your own voice, you, you, you start your own company. Um, I'm not very good at uh, an analyzing the numbers, and but I feel like um, we have we 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 will have a more interesting viewpoint to look at this issue rather than rather than really uh, uh, making a group show with five men and five <laughs> women, and um, also. Um, I think um, it's not just about uh, how many how many things uh, the the museum collect, uh, and it's much more. Oh, I like I like a story. Um, um, when Coke Zero firstly designed is in white, and then um, the sales are very low, and and people don't like Coke Zero, and then they hire an advertising company to figure out what's wrong with Coke Zero because it's really low and it should not it have to succeed. So the result is like this, and the people said because it looks white and it feels like very um, very like an angel and then they will associate that I oh, is feminine and then feminine is not cool so we are not drinking Coke Zero and then the whole campaign um, we decide the can and change it to black and then it's a seed so I, I always feel like um, the the men and women artist thing is much more like much more than how many art, artists how many women art, how many collection and it's how we make white the new cool and how we like but it's a really big project it's not just one person can do that maybe steve job also doing that and then there's a lot of people doing that to make the white the new cool so it's relate how i think about yeah the woman issue i, I like that tagline <laughs> um okay we've got about you know, 10 10 minutes left um maybe we can um, ask the audience if they have any questions for any of our speakers or all our speakers. Please um, put up your hand and let us know your name, please. Lan Zi Wala. Hi, um, I also find the figures of all these um, uh, female students in Hong Kong up to like more than 80%, it's very striking. And then I look around and I tend to trust my colleagues, you know, in the galleries, museums, and they all practice professionally. That means they would make their judgment without any discrimination of gender. Like when you curate, when you, you know, work with young artists and so on. So the problem actually is why there's so few graduates, female graduates, who would be able to enter to the art world before they could meet all these curators or educators or all these people. Because like, if we are all act professionally in that professional circle, like in the galleries, they, they definitely would consider the, the excellence and the quality of the works of all these artists, no matter you know, male or female. So I just want to ask all of you in the panel, either you work as curators or organizations, you know, um, um, decision maker or educator, what's your response to this? Like, 
is that what's the reason why all these young female students would not be able to enter to the art world? I can only speak for myself. Is I think it is it's that's the responsibility of being a curator, that you just have to go out there to do your homework properly. And there are just so many artists out there. And you just it's back to that. This is a consciously that this is the decision that we have to make. We have to look more into female artists' work, young artists' work, graduate students work and there there is no other way i think it, every curator needs to take that as on their own shoulders you know it's there is no easy job and if you want to do this right to do it properly uh speaking from the individual that's 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 the thing that we need to constantly keep out in, in our mind that we just have to look out we just have to pay extra attention, but it's, it's really a lot about out there. So there's also solidarity as I come back. If all our colleagues have that uh, awareness, and I think it might be an easy task than just point finger to individuals. And as artist teacher, um, what, what, what's happened to most of your female students? <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> what are the challenges that they faced? Their challenge maybe they they want a more easier life, <laughs> and then they <laughs> go to teach uh, in high school, or primary school. Um, um, maybe maybe sixty percent they they went that way, but. There's still some. I think this is the same. If someone really stay uh, being an artist, it's the same. The numbers, right? Okay. Uh, so do you don't think that female artists find it harder, or to find the support, the personal support, or I family support? Yeah. For them to become artists, full-time artists. Mm. Well, I mean, it's hard enough to be a full-time artist for anyone, anyway. But actually, from my experience, I feel very supported. I think I I feel more supported uh, than if I were a man. Yeah. yeah. So okay, that goes back to my earlier question. Um, you said then you have to, as curators, you have to, because of solidarity, you have to go and look for them. Um, does it suggest that they're harder to find, that they don't aggressively push themselves forward as much as male artists do? No, they, of course, it's definitely the case, but it's a film. Is that for true? A cur of course. And for Why is it of course? I mean, from I think what for every woman in this society, not just an artist, and I think it, 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 the world doesn't allow our voices to be heard easily. So that's why I think respect Ellen Powell so much because she never gives up. Even her works has not been represented exhibited for the last 20 years. She never stops practicing and she creates her own platform. So, but you know, as curator, it's, it's so weird. I talk to the female artists that never give up, just keep on going. And then no matter how hard it is, it feels that this is encouragement. You know, it's, it's, of course you can say that to them, but this is a, such a harsh world. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just the artists in themselves not try hard enough. I, I'm sure they've tried so hard to just to be exposed to it. And, but this is a long, long, long way around. It's, you cannot just tell them, like, keep on trying 10 years, and maybe in the future you will, be, you will be shown. This is a very irresponsible way to say that. But maybe that's the reality. So I can only say that as a curator, we have to try harder. It's not like the art, female artists are not trying any harder. But just being a female in this world, just have to try harder. That's the fact. Um, your question actually reminds me of a conversation that I had with one of our researchers who specifically works on China, and especially we, women artists from China. And she was saying that when she speaks to, to people who were active in the, the early 1990s, for instance, most of the, the women artists would tend to say 
that why are you looking at my work right now? You know, I haven't created an archive because I didn't necessarily think that my work would be very valuable. So some of these artists, this is what the researcher told me, the women artists, they wouldn't be willing to um, be part of a larger community. Maybe they would work more individually, but it also, you know, puts a very big challenge on collecting institutions like Asia Art Archive, because we you know when we say that we identify personal archives of artists, not because their work is amazing, but they contribute to these artistic collectives, you know, the, the larger arts communities, they are educators. So, you know, when we look at their archive, we don't necessarily think about a single artist, but we see kind of a larger picture about an arts community. But when it comes to, to examples like this from the 1990s, that means that our, crit our criteria is also, it's a tricky one. And uh, I think we also have to, to think about those things. And as Freya is saying, yes, you know, one of the, the questions about the visibility, but also, you know, the, the solidarity, emphasis on the solidarity is important. And the, the fact that we keep talking about these things, it's not necessarily a one-off series of events, but, you know, it has to be ingrained in the, the way that an organization thinks about it, or a curator or an artist thinks about their practices. The, oh, it's a long-term uh, commitment, that, that, sorry. But, but yes, you're using the word solidarity again. Um, I meant to ask, um, you know, Lanjiwo, you, Lanjiwo, you were saying, oh, I am confident that curators I work with will not be biased. Uh, but if there's solidarity, should we just give up any pretense that we should be unbiased? No, everybody's biased in, in a certain way. Um, but this is that ideal world that we're working on that, right? We are trying to, why there's so many mi minorities voices need to be heard because we were biased before, hence that's why we were being categorized in a different, apart from the center. What I mean saying that the solidarity is that is ironically that through my career working in art, I had the most being discriminated by female directors female curators, that they are the one who doesn't want to give me opportunities. And it's a, it's a very funny that I'm at this panel because I, most of these are the male curators that I work with that really much more respect what my jobs and give me more opportunities. Well, most of the obstacles that I encounter are from female. So that's also the part of the solidarity that I want to also that's in, endorse here is, of, of course, there, there's no, I think it is, Kind of difficult just to solve things in a binary way it's either bias or unbiased or it, it doesn't work that way it just i don't know i don't have a clever answer for that it just it's their experience i think solidarity is important maybe it's about how we speak about our bias for instance when we made the, the project in march we the title was women, women make art history and I remember having a conversation with an audience member at Art Basel and he said that I don't necessarily understand when you choose, why you chose this title because it's humans who make art history. So why, why are you biased in this way? And we were saying that, you know, we, sometimes it's good to, to be biased, just to be a little bit provocative so that we do recognize and we start talking about these larger structural problems. Um, and in that sense, yes, it's sometimes useful to be biased, but you know how to, to talk about it. I think that's the, the main question. Fabio. Is it on? <laughs> yeah. I, I have a, actually a slightly provocative question. Um, we're all very excited that uh, Hong Kong Pavilion next year will be represented by a female artist. Uh, that's long, long overdue. Um, my question is how the panels and I, I've no, um, I confess I don't know the artist's work, so I can't judge on her, on her merit. But how does the panel feel about the fact that the artist actually lives in Los Angeles, is not really an Hong Kong based artist? Is that something that, that the solidarity that we're talking about has to be there, of course, but uh, how does the panel feel about it? Whether it would have been more appropriate to have actually an Hong Kong based artist representing Hong Kong? I'd love to hear you too talk about this. Do, do you know Shelley personally? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't. <laughs> but you, you, maybe you, you talk then. Um, I, I also don't know how to, how to reply, how to reflect to that region thing. Um, 
I don't know. Maybe five thousand ago, LA was Hong Kong, part of Hong Kong. <laughs> I'm just joking because it's like, um, um, I I'm really not a good person to answer to this because uh, personally, I have I have um, I don't know how to think. Uh, with the Venice nationalism thing, and I, 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 I'm not. Um, I I have a lot of struggle with this nationalism thing, and um, but I think Shelley's work um, has a lot of uh, has a lot of uh, question to raise because it's not. She's not based in Hong Kong, and her work is. Uh, uh, not um, you. You are not easily related, even in, on, in the context or in the aesthetic, anything Asia or anything Hong Kong. So, well, I, I think in Venice, as you said, um, that it, it's. Uh, representation of a you know uh, national view or on uh, on their own uh, art practice in their country but Hong Kong is not a country and actually Hong Kong is a uh, so Hong Kong is a very pragmatic place where I think the free spirit uh, work in um, I mean, the Chinese diaspora, Hong Kong is probably the, the biggest Chinatown, I would say, uh, that has all, all the like, uh, people who live or work or study uh, abroad um, originate or they, or they um, work uh, overseas or study overseas and come back and work here. So there, Hong Kong is like an, uh, a hub for all these different um, people together we are we are i think we are not consciously inclusive but i mean i'm not talking about the race but i'm talking about uh there must be something that she can draw from hong kong like um um i think the culture here or uh her experience in hong kong i i I, I, I don't know her uh, in person, but I think that she must have something relate to Hong Kong and that would already At the end enough. of the day, the fact that she doesn't live here anymore doesn't bother the two of you. Mm. Okay. Any, any views from this side of the panel? I think home address is overrated. I would agree with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. You do or you don't? It should have been a Hong Kong based artist. Hmm. Okay. Um, there's a sign that just popped up saying time's up, so I guess time's up. So, well, we can continue this. this huh? Sorry. Oh, um, we have one. Okay, we have one more. Window up. Oh, at the back. Oh. Thank you. Um, I think it's more a comment than a question. I, I don't think I'll be able to phrase it into a question I've tried for the last 10 minutes. But I think I want to thank the panelists for actually raising this. Uh, what we're discussing here is actually a structural problem or a structural issue. And um, it is something that informs our frames of judgment and the way that we infer value and therefore sort of make decisions that would affect what we see and what we collect and therefore what we discuss and discourse about art in this place. And I think, yeah, we should keep talking about these frameworks of judgment. And the stakes here is how do you shift that frame of judgment? And yeah, that's what I want to say. Thank you. OK, one more comment slash question, Whitney. Thank you so much. I think this is really interesting and timely. And I uh, appreciate all of your comments. Um, speaking of Hong Kong, and more specifically to Enid's March examination in the SCMP about the inequality female artists shows in galleries in, in Hong Kong. Would you attribute this imbalance in international galleries 
So somewhat also a little bit provocative when we're talking about identity in Hong Kong and Hong Kong based artists. Would you attribute this imbalance in international galleries to a lack of local Hong Kong directors on the international gallery level that aren't homegrown? And so therefore they wouldn't have the same emotional connection to supporting local Hong Kong female artists. That might be a language barrier. Maybe they're not aware of the Hong Kong local Cantonese culture. Um, yeah, uh, please, uh, I'd love your thoughts on that. Thank you. But then international galleries generally don't represent a lot of Hong Kong artists full stop, right? Male or female. Um, I, but um, the ratio for international artists is, I found, a bit different from local galleries. Um, so I think only I don't know, 15 or 17 percent of their solo shows were for female artists. Um, and um, actually, that's something that we didn't get around to discussing. Um, do you think that local galleries, commercial galleries, show more female artists than international ones? Because local galleries deal with a, you know, the mid or lower segment of the market rather than the, you know, the, you know we're not talking about big bucks. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, maybe the audience should answer that question since we have quite a few gallery owners here. <laughs> um, okay, I think um, I think um, we are we've, we've overrun, and let's take the discussion off the stage. But um, I want to thank our panelists one more time: Doris, Ellen, Oscar, Freya. Um, really thrilled to have heard your views today. And um, thank you very much. Thank you.